I just want to you know, say how um, resilient she was and how much joy she brought to our lives. It is the tragic ending in so many domestic violence situations. Prosecutors in Minnesota have upgraded a man's charges to first-degree murder after they say he got out of jail after assaulting his girlfriend, then allegedly went to her home and killed her. It is the case of Danica Bergeson, and we're speaking with her father. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Law & Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. Okay, now before we get into this story, I have to warn you, it's about alleged domestic violence. The details are really not easy to hear. This is a tough case. So prosecutors in Minnesota have upgraded charges for 39-year-old Matthew Brenneman, who is accused of killing his ex-girlfriend, former Army medic, 33-year-old Danica Bergeson. He is now charged with a count of first-degree murder and two counts of second-degree murder. We'll get into those in a second. But here's the kicker of this story. 11 days, 11 days before this alleged murder, he was released from jail after attacking Danica. Yeah. So in June, Brenneman pleaded guilty in two separate domestic violence cases for striking, biting, and choking Danica. But as part of the plea deal, he was released as he awaited sentencing in August, and he agreed to not have any contact with Danica, but now he's accused of going to her apartment and killing her. The building manager called police after hearing yelling and banging sounds from her apartment. This is according to the probable cause statement. And he told police that there had been domestic violence issues between Danica and Brenneman before. But when police got inside the apartment, they say they found Brenneman on the floor of the bathroom convulsing after drinking bleach. They found Danica wrapped up in blankets and a plastic garbage bag over her head. She had apparently been dead for days. Now, officers also found these alleged suicide notes all over the apartment that they say were written by Brenneman. And they say, quote, I never loved any woman I was romantically involved with as profoundly and honestly as Danica. Then there's another one that says, I blacked out, and lost control, and sadly hurt a woman for the first time in my life. That is interesting phrasing. He also allegedly wrote, I can't try to live after this. The end, Matthew. Police took Brenneman to a hospital, then they arrested him and booked him into jail. His bail has been increased to $2 million, and he's expected back in court this upcoming Monday. His public defender has filed a motion to dismiss the second-degree murder charges because she says the medical examiner didn't determine an exact cause or manner of death. That motion was filed, though, before the upgraded first-degree murder charge was added, and the judge, by all accounts, hasn't ruled on that motion yet. Now, just to be clear, the indictment now lists three counts against Brenneman, First-degree murder while committing domestic abuse with a past pattern of domestic abuse. Second-degree murder while committing a felony. And second-degree murder while under restraining order for protection. In a statement, Hennepin County Attorney Mary Moriarty said, quote, intimate partner violence requires a powerful response. It is an act that leaves traumatized survivors and devastated families in its wake. We are aggressively prosecuting those who commit this violence. Okay, so with all of that laid out, and with all of that in mind, I want to talk more about the case, but more specifically, Danica as well. And joining us right now is a very special guest. We are joined by Danica's father, David Bergeson. David, thank you so much for coming here on Sidebar. First of all, not only do we really appreciate you coming on during this difficult time, but I just want to let you know, I am so sorry for your loss. I'm so sorry for what you and the family are going through. It is, uh, it is unimaginable, and I'm so sorry. Well, thank you for having us, and I certainly appreciate the kind words. Um, I, I want to just ask how you're doing, how you and the family are doing at this time. Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a struggle, right? It's uh, a, a tragic thing to have to, um, you know, take the journey through, and uh, it's a long process. It, it continues on and on forever, it seems like. But I, I think, uh, for the most part, we're doing well. You know, uh, we're a bit spread out these days. Um, and uh, getting back to court dates and things like that are, are sometimes difficult. But we've got a lot of support, um, an awful lot of family support, a lot of friends that have supported us, and that has really helped, uh, especially um, initially when we were kind of going through some of the, the concerns with uh, where the defense was at, where the judges might be uh, taking this uh, from a, the direction of the court. Um, we had an awful lot of support, and we really appreciated that. That's amazing to hear. That's amazing to hear. And um, I hope you get continued support throughout the process. Um, you know, just reading about Danica, seeing her, 
she seemed like a lovely young woman. She really seemed so special. Um, for for people who don't know, what was she like? I mean, who was she? Yeah, I mean, she was uh, an incredible personality, um, so you know, vibrant and so full of energy um, and so giving. I mean, I, th I think that was part of her downfall, uh, getting into this situation with this gentleman who, uh, you know, took her life. You know, she was, um, um, had, had, had struggled with, uh, you know, some things through, through college, uh, you know, had got herself straight, um, you know, with um, military service. But I think just going back historically, you know, Danica was, um, came out of the uh, Hennepin County uh, um, foster care. We were foster care parents originally, and she moved in with us when she was age six. And then we adopted her when she was nine. And I think through those early years, you know, she had some pretty traumatic life experiences. Um, and I think some of that lived with her throughout her life. But I just want to, you know, say how um, resilient she was and how um, much joy she brought to our lives. Uh, she was a, you know, a great student. Um, she excelled um, academically. Um, she excelled athletically. Uh, you know, she was on a, a state championship swim team. She, um, you know, played rugby in college. When she was in the military, they had, uh, um, I think there were 1,200 kids in her battalion that were going through basic training, and she won soldier of the cycle. Out of the, all 1,200 kids, she was the most mm. physically fit and uh, scored the highest on her on her oral exams. So, you know, just she really had some really great qualities, some real leadership qualities. And, uh, you know, it's just a shame to, to see a life um, put out like that. It is. It sounds amazing. I mean, she went to the U.S. Army, then goes back to studying animal science, working as a, at a veterinary clinton, clinic. Just amazing. Um, you, you mentioned uh, Brenneman. Mm -hmm. Did you ever meet him? What did you know about the relationship? I, I never met him, um, and there really wasn't much of a relationship. Uh, I, I think they, they might have, you know, be, been friends. They kind of dated a little bit, but uh, right from the very get-go, I think there were problems. Um, and, you know, she was pretty badly assaulted early on in that relationship, um, I want to say in March. I think they made, started going out a little bit in February, and uh, he assaulted her in March. He was uh, charged with uh, domestic violence, I believe, at that time, or uh, aggravated assault. And uh, and I don't know that he went to jail on that first experience, but I do know shortly thereafter there was another episode where he um, had a, a pretty violent ex um, exchange with her, and uh, he was um, put in prison. And uh, yeah, I think he was there for maybe three months. Um, but yeah, I really didn't know much about him. Uh, didn't have any exposure, and she didn't talk much about him. Oh, and, she uh, didn't. She didn't talk much about him. No, no. no. So didn't didn't know a whole lot. I think you know from what I can tell, you know, Danica had a uh, you know, and, and this is kind of historically, she would you know befriend people and try to help people that were struggling. Yeah. And uh, I kind of have a feeling that this is kind of where this relationship started. The guy, the guy was probably. Um, looking for some help and, and um, she, he found a, found someone that would, would be his assistant, I guess. In, David, in that. What, what do you make of the fact that he was released from jail and then allegedly killed her 11 days later? I, I don't, that's the part that I think a lot of people are shocked by. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, I mean, that's, we feel the same way. I mean, I don't understand. I mean, somebody that has a Danco order, you know, um, you know, a, basically a restraining order against him. How does he find a way to go right back to the very address that he can't go to without anybody being able to, to follow up on that? Um, and, you know, I think he was there from what we know from cell phone records and some of the things that we've heard. I mean, he was there almost immediately after he got out of prison. Um, I, I don't, I mean, almost to the day, perhaps. Did you speak to law enforcement about this, about how, how he was able to do this, why nobody was checking where he was going, or is this just the system? Is this just the, the system? system? It's the system. Um, mm -hmm. It wasn't anybody, no, nobody had the responsibility. There's no teeth, um, you know, in, in what had uh, happened when he was released. There was no, nobody that was going to follow up or check on where he was at. Unbelievable. So, yeah. Yeah. He, he was hit with these upgraded charges, now first-degree murder. What do you think about that? Yeah, we'd been waiting for that to happen. I mean, it was uh, – when you read the police report, and I don't know if you've had access to, to read the police report, it's, it's 
you know, a pretty incredible document to go through and understand what had actually happened. But, you know, we uh, were always wondering why um, he wasn't charged with first degree or first degree murder to start with. But I think in the state of Minnesota, they, they, they lead with the second degree murder charges and then a grand jury is convened and then those file or charges are filed. So it just took time. But um, through our uh, working through our prosecutor team, prosecution team, we, we knew that that was going to come. And, um, you know, they've been helpful in, in keeping us abreast of what's been going on. So we feel good about that. Yeah, I mean, the first degree murder charge is so specific, but it seems to apply here about domestic violence. Um, you mentioned what the police report says. You know, one of the other disturbing aspects is when police arrive there, they find Brenneman chugging this bleach. They find these notes all over the place. The notes are very disturbing and telling. What do you think about them? Yeah, I just, uh, they're very graphic. And uh, it's, it, it's painful as a parent to see what Danica must have been going through and uh, to hear, you know, or read what, you know, his thoughts were. You know, he's trying to commit suicide, and I can honestly tell you I feel good that he wasn't successful because I want him to be able to go through this process and be punished for it. You know, I mean, suicide is an easy way out in my in my view, so I'm glad he's, you know, in custody and he's going through this process, and, and uh, hopefully we'll get, you know, a true justice out of this. By the way, David, how did you find out what happened to your daughter? Um, I was traveling. I was in Canada, and... and uh, uh, her mom, Leticia, had uh, got a visit from the uh, Hopkins Police Department. They came to the house and uh, and and gave her the, the the news, and then they called me. So but they they as soon as they found out, they did come over with a, a chaplain and uh, one of the detectives. So, and when you found out that he was in the apartment um, and that he was the main suspect, were you shocked? Were you surprised? Were you or was this like? You, you, because of well, what I happened past, knew, what, what happened with the past with uh, Danica, we knew immediately yeah. um, who it was, um, just based on what had gone on previously with uh, the uh, the Danco order. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't think. Well, we're certainly surprised what happened, but we're, we weren't surprised to hear who it was. And um, a lot of the details didn't come out till maybe 30, 30 days later, um, when you know the detectives could kind of tell the story. Um, or at the first hearing as well, but you know, yeah, it was uh, it was a very difficult time and and hard to hear. I wanted your perspective on what his defense team is doing. Um, so they've yeah. been trying to get the charges dismissed, at least the second degree charges dismissed, um, saying yeah. that there was no uh, cause or manner of death listed by the medical examiner, and therefore the charges should be thrown out. Uh, they filed yeah. that motion. I don't think the judge has ruled on it yet. What's your take on that? I'm not concerned about it, um, and we've been working closely with the prosecution uh, for that for that same reason. The, this medical examiner here in Hennepin County has a history of of, of not filling out cause of death. Um, remember George Floyd? Of course, it was same thing. He had there was never a cause of death on his death certificate, um, and so our prosecution has dealt with this medical examiner on a number of cases. And they've always prevailed. It's not been a stumbling block um, because the, the the proof will come out in the uh, in the trial, or or, or you, know, they, you know they're very confident. Do you know why he hasn't filled it out? Well, he filled it out. He just said, said the cause of death unknown, but it's you know it's a asphyxiation, and he just can't mm -hmm. pinpoint it. But we don't right. we don't know why he I, I, why he left the blank. Are you going to maybe get an independent analysis done or no? Well, we'll wait and see if there's something that comes up with this, but I don't think it's needed. Um, yeah. I, our, our, our team feels you know, solid about where they're at with this uh, situation. Right. It's not going to get dismissed. And, um, you know, it's just this is not the first time that they've gone through this with this medical examiner. Right. And they have, they've been successful. David, I mentioned the notes uh, that were found, and, and, you know, one of them says that he never – attacked a woman before, which is strange considering he pled guilty to doing just that uh, beforehand. And then there's this phone call that he allegedly has with his father where they talk about, you know, almost downgrading the charges. That, to me, as a lawyer, seems to signify, you know, a consciousness of what he did. What is your take on that phone call? Well, I think it's pretty telling. 
<laughs> you know, I don't know. Uh, I haven't seen what what the actual content of the call was, but I certainly, you know, feel that you know if he's having that discussion with his father, that there's obviously uh, you know a, a, a thought process going on there that he's trying to find a way to get out of it. You know, and I, and, and and it's also not true that he hadn't. Um, assaulted anybody before. He also had a restraining order put against him um, with a previous, um, you know, a previous woman that uh, he had an issue with. So it wasn't the first time. Yeah, th- to give you an idea, he they talked about the theory of manslaughter. So that would be obviously a lesser charge than the murder charges, and that uh, mm-hmm. uh, and there was a comment that said a crime of passion might get a lighter sentence. So it seemed that yeah, they were I'd- talking about that. Yeah, I do remember the, the crime of passion being mentioned. So, yeah, I mean, they have that re- on recording. So, I, yep. you know, I think that's that's telling. You, unfortunately, and your family are now the center of this horrible case. Um, this happens across the country so many times. Um, and, and, you know, what Danica went through is what a lot of, unfortunately, people go through. Now that you're in the middle of this, what do you want people to know about domestic violence? What are you hoping they learn from this uh, as a result? Because it's really just a tragic case. And um, I think there's a lot of questions that need to be answered. Yeah, I, I think we've had a lot of discussions on on how we can bring some visibility to it. I know we've had a lot like a lot of support at, at the court hearings. We've had a lot of people turn up, you know, wearing purple, uh, representing domestic violence. You know, we were talking about, you know, um, with maybe trying to bring some legislation uh, to the forefront. We've got some friends, some attorneys that are working on that and have had some discussion on that. But we'd certainly like to, to make this um, a case in point where people can can um, maybe find some solace well, you know, where laws can get changed, you know, where something can be addressed. You know, how do we keep people from getting out of jail and immediately going right back to, to what they're where they're not supposed to be. Yeah. So, you know, especially on the, um, you know, the, the ability to just walk out of jail and uh, have nobody know where you're at, no, no ankle bracelet, uh, no monitoring device um, is upsetting. And, and, and that needs to change in this environment. I mean, that's what should have happened. Um, we should have been alerted. I, I think Danica was alerted that he was getting out and she was scared to death. You know, I had been in the hospital with her um, the last time when, when he, um, you know, had beat her so badly, she was so badly bruised and she was, she had bite marks all over her body and, um, you know, she was terrified of the guy. So for him just to be able to come back and, and get in without any, um, monitoring whatsoever is disturbing and you know that's got to help and we want to bring some visibility to that we don't want people to have to go through a tragic event we want people to understand that there are avenues to get help you know and reach out and talk to people about a situation that you may be in it's incredibly difficult to have to go through this and reflect um, about it over and over again so it's um you know hopefully bring some shed some light on a difficult situation maybe it will and i hopefully it does because these are questions these are important questions to have and and, um it shouldn't have happened so um david i again i know that this is just an incredibly difficult time for you and your family i appreciate you speaking about i know it's never easy um but hopefully this does get more exposure and and we can amplify this story and amplify the message that you just uh, delivered and hopefully um you know, someone's life uh, could ultimately be saved as a result. So David Bergeson, thank you so much and wishing you and the family uh, the best as you move forward. Well, thank you. Thank you for having us. Really appreciate it. All right, everybody, that is all we have for you right now here on Sidebar. Thank you so much for joining us. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jesse Weber. Speak to you next time.